Hey, this is Matt once again. What about telling the video? This is another paid request, this time for Luis. Thank you so much for that. And for those interested in requesting any type of videos, topics, react, be commentary, reaction, re review, list, whatever it may be, you just send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. Now, this is interesting. Luis wanted me to do my top 10 favorite standalone 80 slasher films. So, not slasher films that got a franchise like Diamond on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, Halloween, Chainsaw Massacre, stuff. Maybe they can have a remake, but that's it. Now, before I go on, there are a couple films that I don't know if they would be called slashers, because sometimes they are called slashers. So, I would ask you, the viewer, I don't name five movies. Cobra, Jack's Back, Choppy Mall, Shocker, and The Hitcher. Would any of those be considered slasher films? Because Cobra is an action movie, but does have slasher elements, has the night slasher. And if that's the case, then that would be number one. But, like it's have an action slasher movie so again would that be considered part of it if so then it'd be my number one <laughs> if not then I'll look at something else Jack's back with Jane Spader got the blu-ray over there underrated film Jane Spader did a great job again would that be called a slasher just about a guy trying to be Jack the Ripper again, but it's not, you know, a gore, high body count type of movie. So would that fit? If so, it'd probably be... I mean, it'd be on the list, but some people may go, well, that's not a slasher. Choppy Mall, people may go, well, no, it's not a slasher, it's robots. But it's peop you know, people being picked up one by one in a mall. Yeah, it's called Choppy Mall. Since you, you look at some slasher lists and these films are put on there. But people go, no, it's a robot, so you can't. I mean, that's what I mean. Like, what is it? You know, some would say The Terminator is a slasher film. Shocker. Would Shocker be called a slasher film? Because sometimes it is called a Shocker. But as OT, that's called a Shocker. Would you call it The First Power, Lou Devin Phillips, which was 1990? Would you call that a slasher? Although, I mean, there's not a lot of slashing. It, there's a little bit with Horace Pinker. That's what he does. And he kills some cops at the beginning. But then the electrical stuff. So that's for me, like, even the Hitcher. Some would call that a slasher, some would not. So, that's what I'm saying, like, would any of those be considered slasher? If they were, Cobra would be number one. The Hitcher would be number two. And then, number th then I go on with the list I did make. So if those, or, okay, if those are included, I would say Cobra number one, The Hitcher number two, and Shocker would be either number three or number four. Because I really enjoy those films. And the others would probably fit in the top ten somewhere. If they don't, then this is the list. <clears throat> Number one, I'll put April Fool's Day from 1986. Um, I know people were arguing with it, but if I... That'd be spoiling it. April Fool's Day shows that it might not have a lot of gore, and there's a reason why it doesn't. But if you have really good, interesting characters and likable or funny characters, that goes a long way for me. It truly does. I like the cast. Amy Steele, Clayton Rohner, Thomas F. Wilson. It has a great cast. Funny dialogue. Likable people. I just enjoy hanging out with these people. I like the murder mystery aspect. I thought the score by Charles Bernstein was wonderful. Very creepy whistle-like motif. I thought the ending was genius. And with that title, it fits perfectly. 
Yeah, there's a little bit of questions you could ask about, to be fair. Is that 100% concrete? But I still really enjoy the twist, and I really enjoy... I, I love that movie. That's why I was disappointed with the Stream Factory Blu-ray. I didn't pick it up, because there's barely anything on it. So I got a... Uh, I bought another version from someone else, meaning uh, not official. Because I'm not paying 30 bucks with a shitty cover and barely any features and no commentary track and none of the deleted scenes from the alternate extended ending because April Fool's Day was supposed to have a more of an ending to it. And again, I don't know how much I could do the, without spoiling it. But, uh, actually, you know what? Let me show it here. I got it right here, so why not? Let me just find it real quick again. Uh, come on, where are you? Hit it? Oh, it's all the way down here, of course. Don't fall. <laughs> come on, don't fall. Here we go. And actually, I got a few more here, so let me get those real quick while I do this. But, yeah, April Fool's Day, I think it does a lot of things right. It does a lot of things right in terms of atmosphere, musical score, everything in between about that. And there's one more I'm looking for. Where is it? Okay, here it is. All right. I know I should have thought of this beforehand, but I was too stupid and forgot. <laughs> you forget? Yeah, I forget. You forget sometimes? I forgot sometimes. It is what it is. I know I should have just cut it, but... Oh, well. It is what it is. So I apologize for that. But yeah, this, this is the one I have. Much better cover. Love the cover for this. Love the cover for that. And looks good. Does have a Q&A panel. But yeah, this cast is very likable. Love this movie. So that would be number one. I'm sure a lot of people are like, come on, that's not really a slasher. And how the hell could that be your number one? Well, it is. Because again, I love the cast. Um, I could watch it over and over again and be entertained by it. And I, it got a lot of shit, and I think it's underrated. And it deserved a better Blu-ray. That's why I'll stick with this and not pay fucking 30-some dollars for a bullshit one. With a shitty Barbie doll fucking cover. Well, in the movie, there's a scene with some dolls. Yeah, I know there's a scene with some dolls. Doesn't mean it should be the fucking cover. It's a stupid cover. Barbie's Dreamhouse cover. Like, this is a much better cover. Like, look at the Stream Factory Blu-ray cover, and then look at this. You tell me which is better of a cover. I'll take this. Not goddamn Barbies. Stupid. And then the, the features are shitty. Number two would be My Bloody Valentine. One more could be said about this. I love the atmosphere in the mining town. I thought they did a great job utilizing that area, especially the mines. It brings a sense of claustrophobia to it and atmosphere to it. I don't mind the cast. Paul Kilman sadly passed away. May he rest in peace. This guy here. Uh, Neil Affleck, I didn't mind the love story. This is the love story stuff done better here than in fucking Halloween Ends. It definitely gives you the kills if you want that, especially this uncut version, which, especially the shit on Stream Factory, I'm glad we finally got a copy where that footage is cleaned up. So, I gotta give Stream Factory its due. That was nice to see. I actually don't mind this cover. I mean, you have... The classic original cover, which I remember this creeping me out seeing it on a video store. Like, 
I saw this, I'm like, ugh. Dude, that is a creepy cover. But I, I like this cover as well. Like, this cover is pretty decent. Um, the features I wish were better. I wish, I wish Michael Felsher Redshirt Pictures did the features. Because the way they did it here with these two cars and asking people the same questions, even though that should not pertain to some people. Like, that question doesn't work with this person, but... Lame special features, but great presentation of the film. 4K, cleaned up version of the uncut version. That's the main reason they get this, not for the features, which is too bad. This deserves like a full-blown documentary, well-edited, by like Michael Felsch or Redshirt Pictures. Not this, was it Justin Beam's fucking stupid ass? But this film is classic. Love this movie. And this is a great double bill. Two holiday films. Both got remakes. The remake of this is alright. The remake of this is one of the worst piece of shits. But this is a great double bill. This gives you gore. Gives more murder mystery. Well, a little bit of mystery here. Uh, I like the characters. I would say I like the characters more in this. That's why I put it above it. But this definitely gives you the gore. Uh, these... Or my idea if Cobra and other Hitcher doesn't fit in there, these would be my two favorite standalones of the 80s. Actually, that might be a good cover picture thumbnail. Nah, I'm not going to do that. Actually, let me put it there. Move the other hand, goddammit. I'll use, maybe I'll use that for the thumbnail. So, April Fool's Day, My Bloody Valentine. Uh, number three, which I forgot to get over there, uh, Silent Rage. Chuck Norris, Beast of Shell, Michael Myers. It's not Michael Myers, but it might as well be Michael Myers. Love Silent I love the creepy music, especially at the opening. And even the intro, I like very good music. Uh, I like... I think the hospital setting definitely gives a Halloween 2 vibe to it. To me, that's a good thing. And, you know, Chuck Norris with the mustache. You did see him kick ass, kick these biker's ass. But then you have the killer becomes unstoppable. I know the makers of the film don't look at it as a slasher film. They look at it more as a Frankenstein movie. But a lot of people, I mean, this was 82. This is the day and age of the slashers coming up. Is that that gory of a film? But, yeah, I did. You want to talk about it's more of a Frankenstein type of movie, but people don't look at it as a slasher film. And that's fine with me, because it's Chuck Doors kicking ass. And if there's one thing Michael Myers is going to be afraid of, it's Chuck fucking Norris. And it is cool, like, there are edits that people have done where it's Chuck Doors going up against, you know, Michael Myers. Because, you know, this is a Halloween 2, both in the hospital. That's all I, say. I mean, that's all I need to say. Chuck Norris takes the shit out of wannabe Michael Myers. That alone is badass enough. The, the villain did a good job. Had a good look to him. Creepy demeanor. Did some Chuck Norris ass kicking. I don't think it's that goofy or silly as some people make it out to be. It's fucking Chuck Norris, come on. Can't go wrong with Chuck Norris. Number four, I can't show it because it never got a DVD. Now some would argue this is not a slasher film, but I'm going to say it is. It's just the killer utilizes a different type of weapon, and that's murder by phone. That film is still on VHS. I wish Vendor Syndrome or someone else would get a Blu-ray of that. I really do. If, if people ask, what's a film you want on Blu-ray, it's Murder by Phone. You see some of the other shit that gets on Blu-ray, this is better than a lot of that shit. It stars Richard Chamberlain as a professor. A student of his, he's found, he's heard that she's been killed. And this killer, you find out, works for a phone company, and utilizes his device... So when people pick up the phone, he sends this charge that 
electrocutes them, fries them, their eyes are bleeding, their ears are bleeding, their nose are bleeding, and since so it's a shot where they get propelled back and get killed. Some get propelled back through windows and glass and it's a it's it's yeah, it's goofy. But it's a fun idea. It's kind of, it's a very original idea too. And I remember I did a first time viewing and I looked at the cover, I thought it'd be a piece of shit. So I, years ago, for those who don't know, I did this thing called first time viewing. Where I just picked like random films. And there were a lot of bad ones, but there's some gems I found. Shockma was one that I liked, and this was one I really liked. Because I looked at the cover, I'm like, murder by phone, and it's a woman going... But I'm like, wow, Richard Chamberlain is in this? And John Houseman from, like, uh, the very beginning of John Carver's The Fog, telling the, the ghost story, and from James Towns Rollerball, like, John Houseman is in this? And I really liked it. I thought it was an interesting idea. I thought Richard Chamberlain was the MVP. I was interested to see how this would play out. And for a film that is only on VHS... I don't think it's nearly as bad as people think it is. And when I see things like Flesh Eater get a fucking 4K, Murder by Phone deserves it, man. So I put it higher on, I enjoy the film, it's underrated, it deserves it more than it's gotten. I will say that's one thing I was a bit miffed by Michael Felsher, I will be honest. I asked him a question about that, and he's like, oh yeah, there's such a goofy, you know, bad movie. I'm like, come on, Felsher, it's not that fucking bad. I mean, you're praising George Romero's survival of the dead. Come on, dude. Murder by Phone is way better than survival of the dead, where, you know, zombies eat fucking horses. But again, that gets into the subjective, we all have our different opinions type of stuff. And I guess it made me miff because if he feels that way, that means other people feel that way. And that means a film that I think is decently underrated will never get the time of day. I'm like, look at some of these fucking films that get the time of day and a lot of them... In Listen, reality, they all deserve it because every movie has a fan. But it's just one of those where I wouldn't be as harsh if films like this got the release. Then I'd be like, I don't care. You have your film and you can enjoy it. But when it does, I'm like, well, what the fuck, you know? But it is what it is. Number five, I put Silent Madness. Silent Madness. This is a film that... I was going through a tick where I was going through horror films of the 80s, especially films I'd never seen before, and I saw this cover, I went, you know, this cover, I never heard of this film before, and when it came out, it was in 3D, and it's a slasher film, let me give it a look, let me give it a shot. And then, watching the film, realizing there's some weird stuff edited from it, but if you watch a VHS from overseas, those scenes are put back in. Because when this first came out, there's this weird cut where the lead character's in this vent, and someone's coming towards you, towards her. But then it cuts to boom, she's going outside. I'm like, wait a minute, this is an awkward jump. What happened? And like some of the gore was taken out. Because this is not like a gore-filled movie, but this is a couple decent bits. And that's why I was so excited Vinegar Syndrome was releasing this, and I grabbed it, and I, I, I enjoy this film. I think this film's a lot of fun. Because I like Belinda Montgomery as the lead. She kind of reminded me of like a female Loomis from Halloween. I thought she really carried the film. As a... What was her character's name? I'm trying to see if they say her character's name. No, just Belinda Montgomery. But I liked her in it. 
uh, the kills, while some of them could have been goyer, I like some of the different types of kills, like the idea, like someone's head being put in a vice, or a person playing Dragon's Lair Arcade, and going to this thing where they're tied up and thrown out the window. There is a good drill to the head. I actually didn't mind the story where I was liking Belinda and her bit of a love story, but the same time her looking into this, and then how this hospital fucked up and they're trying to cover her up, so they're trying to. They have these two orderlies that are trying to silence her and trying to kill the doctor, but then also they're dealing with the killer. Um, the finale, I like the bit in the vent, and like this weird blade thing that the killer's lowering down to try to cut her to pieces. This is one flashback dealing with a nail gun. Um, the ending, there's no sequel bait ending. There's no stupid downbeat ending. Um, the 3D aspects are kind of fun to see on a novelty way. Uh, yeah, this one I really did like. I really, you know, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. But uh, this surprised me. So again, if Cobra and the Hitcher and stuff don't count, if Shocker doesn't count, if it did, it'd be Cobra, Sh Hitcher, Cobra the Hitcher. If it counts, Cobra would be one, the Hitcher would be two. Uh, either April Fool's Day or Shocker would be three. My Bloody Valentine would be... And then one would be four. And then My Bloody Valentine would be five. If none of them count, then... This is number one. This is number two. Silent Rage is three. Murder by Phone is four. And this is number five. Number six, I put Intruder. It would be higher if the ending was better. If the ending was better, it'd be easily top five for me. Because I love that it takes place in a store. Because I can relate to working in a store. I can relate working the night shift. I love Scott Speedle's sense of direction where he tries to go with a lot of crazy style POVs through inside telephones, uh, the camera following the shopping carts. I love how he, it's like I have this one setting, let me make it as interesting as possible with all these crazy point of views and some would say it's too much but I like that. I like someone trying for that stuff to make it unique and interesting. I think the store and the way they liked the inside of the grocery store was moody. And the gore, when you watch the uncut version, insane gore by Tam B. Insane gore. People's getting cut in half. Like, you want to see gore, there you got gore. Per person's head being crushed by the trash compactor thing. Crazy shit. Now, my two flaws with the film is, one... The lead characters, meh. I, I'm, I'm different to them. I don't think they're that strong. They're not horrible, but they're not that strong. And the ending I thought was really lame. Where that guy's obviously the killer, but these two are going to get blamed for it because these cops are the dumbest cops ever. And then the killer may be alive, and then the girl screams, and I went, this is a lame ending. Why end it that way? So that was kind of a sour grapes for me. If you know, if it didn't have that stupid ending, it'd be a much higher. But I still enjoy a lot of it, and it still, for me, deserves to be on the list. Intruder. Number seven, I put Terror Train, which I know they remade it. <laughs> But the original Terror Train I really enjoy with Jamie Lee Curtis. I like it more than Prom Night. Road Games, I was going to put on a list, but again, would that be a slasher film? Or is that more like a Hitchcock rear window thriller? I think it's more like that. Otherwise, I put it on a list because I love Road Games a lot. In fact, I'll probably put that decently high on the list. But I think people would say that's more of a thriller. So, Terror Train. I like the idea of a slasher film being on a train. Um, it was cool to see Hart Botner, Ellis from Die Hard. Uh, 
before he was in Die Hard. I thought Jamie Lee Curtis did a good job. It felt like she had a lot more to do here. Because I love Halloween too, but she yeah, she's in a bed most of the time. Uh, it did feel like she had much to do in Prom Night because of the story. She really didn't have interactions with the killer until the very end. Here, she just felt more integral to the story. I like the idea of the killer wearing different... Because it's a costume party. He kills someone, takes their mask. He'll kill someone, take their mask. It's not the goriest film, but... Like I said, I like the location. I like um, the motif of the killer looking different each time. Oh, God, I forget the guy who's the, the train conductor. He's an older, established actor. I really like him. I'm bad with names, though. He's like the older, established actor in the movie. I, did, I really liked him. I thought he did a good job. Like he's trying to, you know, I, I got these card tricks, and like he's trying to impress people. Like he was a likable character. And I thought the ending had a good fight chase. Like when she closes herself in that cage, and the killer's trying to get these pipes through the stab and impaler, and some of them come pretty damn close to her. <laughs> no stupid bullshit sequel bait, downbeat ending, really like Terror Train, so that's number seven. Number eight, Amsterdam. Now this is a film from overseas by this guy named Dick Maas who did The Lift about the killer elevator and then he remade his own movie called The Shaft also known as Down. Yeah, all shitty titles to be fair, but I like the remake. Naomi Watts is in it because it's, it's goofy, but it's fun. I mean, the remake, the American remake, the, ba the good guy kills the elevator because it has a heart and shoots it with a bazooka. You know, it's got Aerosmith's love in an elevator at the end. It's got, you know, Ron Perlman and other people making cameos. Dan Adea, Michael Ironside making cameos. You know, it's got titties in the first 10 minutes. Like, that's a fun but exploitation you know, people's heads get cut off, someone's legs get cut off. That, you know, for a killer elevator film, you know, I thought it was pretty fun. <laughs> um, unlike The Lift, which was incredibly boring. But anyway, he did this 80s slasher film called Amsterdam. The canals... Oh, I forgot what they're called. They're a tip, tip of my tongue. There's a killer who wears this sort of wetsuit as he swims in the canals and will kill people and bring them down. And this cop is on the case. And it has some good kills and slasher motifs, but it's also well directed. There's a fucking boat chase scene where the cop is chasing the killer or something. I, I forget if it was the killer or a suspect. It's been a while since I've seen it. And the boat chase is as good as a James Bond film. I'm not kidding. There's like another one where, another cool bit where one of those tourist boats and they're going past a bridge, but the killers hunt a dead body on the bridge. So the body like is now being dragged across the top of this. It's like a glass ceiling. People are seeing the body being dragged and the smear of blood behind it. Ah, you know. Amsterdam is a pretty good one that no one mentions. Number nine, this is where it's tough because there's a couple I could choose for different reasons. You know, number nine, people don't groan at this, the final terror. I think because I like the way the location of the forest is shot. I think Andrew Davis and the cinematographer did a really good job shooting it. It's a really striking looking film for me. But also, I like the cast. You know, Daryl Hannah and, and these other people. I like their interactions. You got Joel Pantoliano in it. Uh, granted, that film has issues where there's not a high body count at all. And there's not really much of any gore, so people will find it boring. But like I said, I liked the way it was shot. 
I like the look of the film. It didn't bore me because I liked the cast. I liked hanging out with these folks. Uh, I liked how they try to stick together and try to be at least a little bit smarter than some slasher characters are. Because they actually do stick together. I like, yeah, they stick together and they survive. <laughs> and they're. I, I actually didn't mind the way the killer died at the end. Without giving it away. A little bit of survival quest type of thing. I don't know. A lot of people give a crap. And I remember watching going. You know what? I don't think it's that bad. If you're looking for kills and gore. You will think it's bad. But to me. Because I, I didn't mind the cast of characters. Um, uh, the cast and the look of the film. It actually didn't bother me as much. I don't mind the final terror. And number 10, I put Fade to Black. Dennis Christopher is this film-obsessed guy, and he's pushed to his limits, and he starts killing people as a revenge, And but he's playing different characters. Like He's playing Dracula at one point, or The Mummy at one point, or James Cadney at one point. Hopalong Cassidy... He's using the obsession with films as a turning point to get revenge on the people who wronged him. Um, Fate of Black has a really good lead performance by Dennis Christopher. That's another one I'm glad. I believe Vendor Syndrome released that. I'm glad they did. It deserved a release long ago. I had to put that in the top ten. Because that's one I remember for a long while going, man, they should release this film. And they finally did. Although it does have its flaws, Tim Thomerson, I like Tim Thomerson, but his entire role as this psychi psychiatrist, completely pointless. Easily take that out of the film, nothing would have mattered. So again, to say for the 18th time, I apologize, but if Cobra and Shocker and the Hitcher and stuff don't belong on the list, if they do, they'd be on it. If not, we got number one, April Fool's Day. Number two, My Bloody Valentine. Number three, Silent Rage. Number four, Murder by Phone. Number five, Silent Madness. Number six, Intruder. Number seven, Terror Train. Number eight, Amsterdam. Number nine, The Final Terror. Number ten, Fade to Black. If I had a couple runner-ups, on number eleven, I would put Blood Hook. Because this is one of the strangest slashers I've ever seen. There may be people that might get bored with it, but again, this is such a strange comedic slasher where a killer uses a big fish hook to kill people and grab and drags them, and the guy's going crazy because he has some metal plate from Vietnam and cicadas and the noise they make, also people's music from rock and roll will make the metal plate make them go crazy, and... <laughs> The acting's not that good and stuff, but like I said, it's just a peculiar premise and ideas that it was kind of fun and fascinating in a way. And I like some of the bits of gore like this. I, saw, I thought some of that gore worked well. And yeah, that's why I remember seeing it once and being like, you know, that, that was kind of really interesting maybe not good but interesting and so I'll, that would be on you know and then th this other film it is so bad it's funny don't go in the woods because it's a hilarious film it's an awful film in like every way but it's so funny that it from the song don't go in the woods today or you will be killed. They cut you up in little pieces. I, I can laugh my ass off of that. And at least it brings me entertainment. Number 13, I would put The Burning. Because I like The Burning. That is one I'm surprised never got a franchise. But you know what? Not everything needs a franchise. Has some nice effects by Tom Zavini. It's much lower on the list because... After the scene with the raft... How do I put this? It shoot. It shot its load. It shot its load. And it was never as good as that scene afterward. But I did like the idea that it was a final guy at the end. And not a final girl. 
that made it at least a bit different. It was cool to see people like, uh, what was it, uh, Jason Alexander from Seinfeld. He was in this before that. Uh, Holly Hunter had a small role. Oh, the woman who is the reporter in Bloodsport. She's in this. So I like some of the cast members. I like some of the effects by Tom Zavini. Um, so I do like the film. Like I said, it, when it got to that scene with the raft, it was so much of a central scene that the rest of it kind of dwindled after it. But like I said, it was interesting that the ending... Usually the typical final girl. It was a final guy. I'm like, okay, that's made a bit different. And we'll stop it there. You know, lucky number 13. So, I guess this is top 13, but I'll just say top 10 just because. So, thanks for watching. And he said 80s. If you want, why not this? It did 80s slasher standalones. Not 90s or other 80s. But thanks once again, Luis. You guys take care, and uh, we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.